It is always slightly daunting, to be honest, to come at the end of a conference and uh, to be asked to do the closing speech when you haven't really heard very much and you haven't kept up with all the, the deep dynamics and all you're really trying to do is pick up on a few things and see if you can weld them into something vaguely coherent. Um, I do have a really interesting historical bit of archive, actually, which is relevant to the theme of communicating this agenda, which is when I was chair of the Ecology Party and heading up the election campaign in 1979. And the first television broadcast I ever did with uh, independent news in those days, I'd been interviewed for about three minutes, somewhat flippantly, and my interview at the time picked up the Ecology Party manifesto then, tore a page out of it, and started to eat it. <laughs> and this was all with a view to demonstrating that Ecology Party policies were clearly homespun, recyclable, and edible. And he thought this was the funniest thing he'd ever done as a broadcaster. And I'm not joking, the whole session ended with him absolutely collapsing with laughter at his own cleverness. <laughs> And this is why this is quite an important archive for me. Me sitting there looking <laughs> so angry, as if I was, could reach over and just throttle this man. I'm happy to make that archive available to you, Kathy, if that's, um, <laughs> if that's helpful. But that last little discussion, I'm going to have to be really careful not to go off in all sorts of tangents. I have got some plans, but I'll try and, <laughs> I'll try and avoid the tangents, OK? But I just want to do one tangent, because I was really struck that this notion that uh, this communicate had had a higher emphasis on some of these issues to do with spirituality and uh, values-led perspectives on all of this. And I'm absolutely convinced that this is firstly going to become an increasingly important part of our work as communicators, as multipliers of complex uh, messages. And I'm also perfectly convinced that that shouldn't make anybody else feel uneasy. And there are still a lot of people who do feel distinctly uneasy at the S word, at the spiritual word. Um, I know this. I suffered this at first hand when I was at Friends of the Earth, where anything to do with spirituality was described as eco-la-la. And <laughs> most of the Friends of the Earth local groups would have no truck with it at all. It was far too subversive. And it would jeopardize our hard-earned scientific Objective reputation. So I know how difficult some people find the spirituality bit. And I think that is really something we have to deal with. And I see this in terms of a theme I want to keep coming back to, which is what I call multidimensionality. Sorry, long concept idea. But it's a really important bit of what we're doing here. So how can I give you a sense of what I mean by multidimensionality? Imagine you've been on a BTCV green gym and you're just walking back from your dry stone walling or whatever it is that you've been doing at rhododendron clearing or whatever, and you're walking through this beautiful bit of woodland, feeling fantastically good, happiness brimming over, and you're beginning to think to yourself, that is amazing. Now, what's going on in the wood at that point? Scientists will tell you that what's going on is that you are, in fact, absorbing a lot of the volatile organic compounds emitted from the trees. The most productive tree in the world emits 132 different volatile organic compounds, 132 different chemicals. There are two pathways for these chemicals, particularly the monoterpenes into the human body. One, up your nose via the olfactory system and deep down into the limbic bit of your brain, the sort of reptilian bit of your brain, where it does all its wonderful stuff. Serotonin starts pulsing around and things like this. The other pathway is through the lungs, which then goes into the bloodstream, which is why aromatherapists will tell you that exposure to monoterpenes and other volatile organic compounds of this kind have a benign effect on people's sense of well-being and balance and body. So if you're walking along with a scientist, you might well be having a discussion about how many volatile organic compounds do you think <laughs> that tree is emitting and I'm breathing in. And it would be a perfectly good Discussion, a really important part of understanding the biodiversity of woodland, in a funny kind of way. <laughs> if you're walking along with some rather more suspect, tree-huggy kind of person, <laughs> who might just deviate off into the woods, <sighs> do a little bit of tree-hugging as he went along, you probably wouldn't be talking too much about the volatile organic compounds. 
but you might be talking about the same thing, which is what this is doing to you, your presence at that time, your sense of yourself, the interconnectedness between you and that living environment. And the Japanese have an absolutely wonderful word for this, which I learned some time ago, called Shinrin Yoku. And Shinrin Yoku means wood air bathing. Not breathing in, but bathing. And I love this sense of you know, just going through the forest and you're bathing in all this uh, stuff. So does it matter that some people will be doing this via a spiritual perspective? And some people will be doing it via a scientific perspective? Who cares? What's the problem to anyone else? What is the problem that each person comes at this via a different route? And in fact is able to communicate better the more authentic that experience is the more it moves them personally. Because underpinning everything you've discussed, I'm sure, for the last two days, is the fact that good communications, eloquent, inspired advocacy for better relationships with the natural world depend totally on the authenticity of those who bring that message out to a particular audience. And one of my growing worries is that we are becoming more... Hmm, tendentious word here, but more manipulative in the way that we seek to communicate about the natural world and sustainability. We spend a lot more time segmenting audiences, looking at the kind of data that Nick showed us in the final session, saying, OK, well, that message will work really well for that group of people, but it will be an absolute plonker for that group of people. So let's tailor our communications against this particular set of attributes in this particular segment of the population, and we'll go straight in hard, because we've got the data that shows us that's the way into their brain. Not that different, if you think about it, from all the immense experience built up by the advertising industry over decades, finding out how best to expose people to their messages in different contexts. And sometimes I sit in on these sessions, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is really high-class thinking going on here about how best to, to tailor messages to specific audiences. But lying behind it is quite an instrumentalist, quite an exploitative idea of what we ought to be doing in order to get messages through to people. And I think that's moving into, sometimes moving into a zone of the seriously inauthentic, uh, which actually worries me quite a bit. <clears throat> 